So Dennis says, oh, hi, Dr. Osborne, I take 3,000 milligrams of DHA and 1,000 milligrams of EPA daily for cognitive health. Is that a good dose? Yeah, it's not too bad. You're at four grams total. I would balance that out a little bit more. You're a little high on DHA and a little low on EPA, Dennis, so I would look more for closer to one to one. Uh, even if it's not perfectly one to one, you're at you're at one to three EPA um, to DHA, and I would look to kind of get it closer to to an equilibrium between the two. Um, um, opinions on cod liver and krill oil. So cod liver oil does contain omega three DHA and EPA, but one of the problems with persistently using cod liver oils is super high in vitamin A. And um, in the and in, in not beta carotene, but actually vitamin A. And so what can happen is that can stress um, your vitamin D levels, creating a problem there. I also see a lot of people on cod liver oil, um, and, and there are some companies that do this fermented cod liver oil stuff, and that stuff is oxidized and rancid, and it's terrible for you. Don't do that. Um, but, but I also see with a lot of cod liver oils where people are getting enough DHA, but they're getting enough, so it's, it's okay. But the EPA in the cod liver oil, I, you know, it's down. I'll give it a frowny face because I see just so, see so many people using cod liver oil as, as their supplement. And it's very rare that we see their EPA come back at high enough level. So in, in my experience, the DHA comes back okay with cod liver oil, but EPA not. And so you get that imbalance. So, and again, the vitamin A is something else you have to worry about as well. Um, as far as krill oil, krill oil is a good source of DHA. So again, if you're trying to take, some people try to take krill oil to get enough EPA DHA. And the problem again with krill oil is gonna be right here, not enough EPA. You'll get, you'll get good DHA, but not enough EPA. Um, Marie says, hi from the hospital bed. Marie, wishing you um, an expedient recover. My prayers are coming your way. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in from the hospital. Uh, I like this comment. Tom says, Tom and Lisa, love your Omega Max supplement. Lab results prove that they're doing their job and bonus, no nasty fishy aftertaste. So uh, forgive me for the shameless plug, but um, I didn't say it, Tom and Lisa did. Thanks for, for chiming in, Tom and Lisa. Opinion of the one meal a day fasting. Um, you know, I, some people do really well with it and some people do very poorly with it. I don't, I don't think that OMAD as a principle is something that everyone is... is is shaped up to do or that everyone should do. I think that intermittent fasting is something everyone can achieve to a certain level. Um, and, and a great place to start with, with that would be a 16-8 style or 16-8 strategy. And if you don't know what I'm talking about or don't know much about intermittent fasting, go back and watch my show on intermittent fasting. Uh, we just don't, we don't have time to get into the depths of that today. How much of my daily requirement of omega-3 can I get from each egg? Depends on the egg that you're eating. Um, some farmers feed their chicken flax and chia, which will increase the omega-3 levels of eggs to a certain extent. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, you know, I, I don't, you're not going to get a heck of a lot of EPA or DHA from eggs. Most of that is going to be the linolenic acid. So again, there's that conversion that has to happen to activate into EPA and DHA. Um, so egg would not be the source of food I would select in, in an attempt to, to, you know, not that you can't eat eggs, not that eggs aren't healthy, not that eggs can't be a source of, you know, of, uh, of, ALA, of ALA, but I just, you know, you're not going to get much EPA or DHA from it. I take fish oil that has 2,400 fish oil with EPA of 360 and, and uh, DHA of 240. So if you're taking 2,400 and there's only 360 and 240, you're getting ripped off. Um, because the other, you know, that 360 and 240 is only equal to 600 of that 2400. So what is the other 1800 that you're getting? I would surmise if I were guessing that you're getting a lot of omega-6, maybe some omega-9, and you don't need that. You get enough of that from your diet. Again, when you're looking at supplementation, you don't need to supplement with six and nine. They're, they're so ubiquitous in the diet today Supplementing with them is a complete waste of money and bang for buck what you really want to focus on is EPA and DHA So good omega-3 with EPA and DHA 
I think I answered the question about fermented cod liver oil. It's junk and it's oxidized. Stay away from it. I've seen more people come in um, with problems as a result of taking that. I don't know how they ethically produce that and say it's good for people. Um, is it true that omega-3 fats can prevent the onset of psychosis? It just depends on what the psychosis is and why the psychosis is there. It's, it's true that many people that experience psychosis can have EPA or DHA deficiency leading to progression, but um, I wouldn't call it a cure-all for that. Again, everybody's psychosis um, cause, if you will, is, is, is subject to their own uniqueness. So Mary's asking, if I already take magnesium uh, 7 supplement and calm magnesium before bed, what would your Omega product add to help me sleep better? Looking to increase my REM and deep sleep. Any ideas on products? I mean, if you're looking to increase your, your REM sleep, magnesium 3 and 8 is, you know, I don't know what, you, when you say magnesium 7, I, I don't know specifically if that's a brand name or what you really mean. And calm magnesium is probably not magnesium 3 and 8, if I had to guess. Again, without looking at your labels, hard for me to chime in and be 100% accurate there. But uh, magnesium 3 and 8. Magnesium 3 and 8 passes the blood-brain barrier. And it's in, a lot of research has been done on that particular form of magnesium as it's bound to 3 and 8 can get by, by the BBB blood-brain barrier and, um, and help induce better quality sleep. But one of the other big factors is just sleep hygiene. So many people ignore sleep hygiene and try to take supplements to help them with their sleep. But sleep hygiene is important. Turn off your, your wireless, your Wi-Fi, um, you, you know, no major blue lights before bedtime. Consider prayer meditation uh, or journaling before bedtime. Like, like gear down from your day to go to sleep and clear your mind before you go to sleep. And also sunshine. Sunshine is a huge factor. Uh, in, in increasing your REM sleep through the production, the adequate production of melatonin that keeps you in a deeper sleep for longer when you go to bed. A lot of people are sunshine deficient, especially if you live north of 27 degrees latitude. Uh, let's see here. Let's go down on the left side a little bit. Let's see. Yeah, so somebody mentioned a brand and, and on our YouTube space, and, and, I, and I'm not going to say the name. You can go in and you can read the comments, but um, Robert mentioned a brand of fish oil that he takes. And I'll just say this about that particular brand. That brand is horrific. Um, it's junk. We've actually independently tested some of it. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't even contain what it's supposed to contain. Um, but, you know, their, their logo is number one pharmacist recommended. Well, how many pharmacists study nutrition? Pharmacists study pharmacology of, of, of drugs. And they have no expertise really in the realm of nutrition unless they sought out additional expertise. So saying number one pharmacist recommended is like, is like having a product for an electrician that says number one plumber's recommended product uh, for an electrical product. Like it's the wrong group to get to back your product. And of course, pharmacists are gonna recommend it because they don't know anything about it and they're just getting paid, uh, paid for that recommendation. Um, should someone at higher risk of Alzheimer's with family history need more omega-3 and or phospholipids than others do? I've read APOE4 carriers don't process the fats as well and may need more to have the same protective effects. I, I would say that's a great question, Donna. Possibly yes. I mean. It, I don't look at APOE4 as a guarantee in that regard. I've seen cases of people with APOE4, they're doing fantastic. So I don't look at that as a predetermining, um, uh, like predestination toward Alzheimer's, but my advice would be measure it. It's super easy to measure. Um, it's, it's a fatty acid uh, membrane test that can be measured through a blood draw where, where you can determine how much a person is getting in their diet. And once you know that, you know what the baseline is and you can be better guided as to um, how to manipulate the diet in a better direction or if supplementation is something that that person wants to consider, they can do that too. Should we keep omega-3 in the fridge? You don't have to. Um, you can, but you don't have to. Um, you know, provided again, that uh, you don't buy a bottle and it lasts for a year or two years. Like a, a good bottle of omega-3 that's sealed, you know, has, you know, will stay fresh and will stay just fine because it's, 
It's packaged in the right type of packaging. Uh, it has antioxidants inside of it that help protect it from oxidation and, and, and you know, light damage. Uh, so you shouldn't need to keep it in the fridge. I, I find that when a lot of, with supplements, when, Lynn, when a lot of people put supplements in the fridge, the compliance of taking the supplement drops by about half because they forget it's in the fridge. All their other supplements are in a different location. And so oftentimes that one in the fridge gets left out. But a good quality omega-3 will not need refrigeration. Is grapeseed oil bad for me? You know, I don't. I wouldn't use grapeseed oil as a as a staple for food preparation. I, I do think it's a bad idea. It's one of those processed seed oils that's going to be rich in omega six. Um, how much should someone take if detoxifying toxins that are high in fat? You talking about omega threes? How much omega threes should someone take if they're detoxifying? Look, I think omega-3, the standard kind of really strong and really solid therapeutic dose just for a person, if just in good general health, taking two grams a day, but the two grams need to be predominantly 90% of the two grams should be EPA and DHA. And not a bunch of filler oil like omega-6 and omega-9 that's not necessary. And again, I see that all the time. It's because it's super cheap to put those other oils in and EPA and DHA are expensive. And so what a lot of manufacturers do is they, is they downplay the EPA and DHA and put a cheap product in there and then sell the product for a very expensive amount of money and that increases their profit margin. You really have to, you, you know, you have to understand that um, EPA and DHA is what you're looking for. So, so two grams a day, mostly 90% plus of it coming from the EPA DHA. And then, you know, we see fish oil, even the FDA says it's safe up to three grams a day with no known side effects or no known reported issues. But clinically speaking, I, I, I get cases sometimes where we go four, six, eight grams a day, depending on the situation, depending on the person. So again, that's, that's more of, I don't recommend that you go that on your own without actually having monitoring and testing, but um, the omegas are very safe, you know, even at higher doses. So I don't eat fish, however, have been on your Omega Max for six weeks. How long do I need to wait until repeating serum tests to compare results? Um, if, you're, you know, if you want to see a change in the, in the membrane, at least three to four months. Uh, these are red blood cells. So we want to give red blood cells have a life cycle of three to four months. So if you've been on that product for six weeks, take it out another six weeks or so and then have your levels checked. Is omega-9 good for Parkinson's? Omega-9 is no miracle cure for Parkinson's. It's good for people. I wouldn't say it's necessarily good for Parkinson's. It's just it's good for people to get enough omega-9. But again, most people will get enough through their diet. So I don't think supplementation, even with Parkinson's, is going to lead to, at least it hasn't in my clinical experience, ever led to any kind of massive improvements in Parkinsonian tremors or, or symptoms. Best way to test for omega-3 is, is in the phospho, is in the red blood cell membranes. So there's, there's testing that can measure the omega-3 levels and omega-6 levels and arachidonic acid levels in the membrane of red blood cells. Okay, let's see. Does grain, which causes pain, mean you are gluten sensitive? I mean, if you're eating grain and it's hurting you, you may be gluten sensitive, but you may also be reacting to other properties of the grain. So for, so for example, one of the negative properties to grain is gluten. Another negative property to grain are lectins. Another negative property are proteins called ATIs, amylase trypsin inhibitors. Other things about grain that, that drive in the inflammatory process is that they're high in omega-6. So they create an omega-6, omega-3 ratio that's higher to closer to that 16 to one and that drives up the inflammatory response in the body. Um, grains contain heavy levels of molds and mycotoxins which can drive, uh, drive pain. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of elements around what's in grain beyond even gluten that can contribute to inflammatory pain. But, it, you know, if, if you find that when you eat grain and you react, I mean, if you really want to know, are you gluten sensitive, get genetically tested. Like, Mel, if you would, put, put a link up to genetic testing in there. Uh, because that's how you're going to know whether or not going gluten-free is the right thing to do or not. Um, and, whether, and, and whether or not it's gluten versus some other component of grain. Uh, how much omega-3 and 6? So, I mean, again, um, 
I think I answered that question. Two grams kind of as a base for omega-3. What, what we see is, is if you're eating a regular diet, even with some fish here and there, but you're taking two grams concentrated EPA, DHA, that's enough to keep your omega-3 fatty acid membrane levels in a very good place for prevention. Let's see here. So yeah, I like this question because it's a follow-up. So, so Helena, Helena is asking, I, remember, I seem to remember your book not recommending cashews or nuts. Can you remind us why? Yeah, absolutely. So it's cashew is not technically is not a nut. Cashew is a seed. And so the reason why, I'd, you know, people going through no grain, no pain, um, we, we generally, in that, especially in that second phase, we have, have them avoid seeds for several reasons. One is because seeds are hard to digest. And again, people with gluten sensitivity issues that are trying to heal their gut don't want to put extra work on their gut. Uh, but number two is seeds are super high in omega-6. And so what we're trying to do in a person that's going grain-free is we're trying to rebalance their omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So in that, in that first in that first aspect of the protocol, we're avoiding seeds. Now, that being said, not everybody needs to avoid seeds forever. Again, the no grain, no pain diet was written as a generalization to people who don't come to see me in my practice and get tested so that they can understand what they need to do as a unique individual. So I've I created rules in no grain, no pain that anyone could follow without tests to help maximize their progress. So hopefully that helps you uh, understand the whys. Okay, so Danielle is asking, could you please put your gluten-free food source of Omega Foods on your site? It, it actually, Daniela, will be up there and you'll be able to print it out by the end of the week. So uh, if you subscribe to Gluten-Free Society, uh, that, that's actually one of the benefits of subscribing. So when we, when we have you know, mega resources for you that you'd like to bookmark or save, you get emails um, with links to those resources. And this is one that'll be going out this week, later on this week. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.